Hello everyone, it's me again, GW Fan the Softcore Brony, welcoming you back to the beginning of the end on Let's Play Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors. Last time we witnessed the safe ending, which was not really safe, but you know, related to what was in the safe and all that, and now that we've seen that, it is imperative that we chose uh, Begin With Memories uh, once we started the new game here, and if you recall from watching the ending, or if you caught it, then you'll see that we need to go through a certain number, number of doors, this time door four, just like the first time I played through. Now there is a whole ton of information this path is going to throw at us that's going to seem completely irrelevant to the plot, but it's actually quite important, uh, as will become imperative later. Or it's really more uh, important for understanding how the uh, rest of the plot works, honestly, but uh, once we get to that, that point. But uh, there's some information we've already seen, like the whole thing about the morphogenetic field, and, you know, June's a little information about the Titanic and all that, but I'll probably gloss over that, give you like a very brief rundown, if maybe, or something, but there is going to be some inform new information here that I, we will be showing, but uh, I need to get through most of this puzzle first, so I'll meet you there. Once again, we have June's little explanation about the Titanic, and we gotta wonder, you know, what is this thing? It's actually that that particular question doesn't really matter about the, you know, whether it's fake or not. I don't think. And then, yeah, do you know believe in curses? You don't have to. I don't. I didn't myself, but I figure we might as well humor her. Why not? Just for something new. To a certain extent, but he's still kind of doubtful, apparently. I guess it's kind of a dumb question. <laughs> uh. Oh, really? You remember she talked about the guy who predicted the sinking of the Titanic and all that, which is right here, Curse of the Egyptian Mummy, and apparently that was the only thing different about that com that uh, thing there, is what I said. Yeah, they, it was stolen from the pyramid, and somehow it ended up on the Titanic, although I don't think that's happened in real life. <laughs> But, uh... Oh, this is still different, huh? Supposedly she was special. Yeah, what do you mean? Yeah, she was really pretty. Okay. Why was that... They changed that one line just because I said I believe in curses, sort of. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, she was frozen somehow, despite being brought through the desert and all that is what the whole thing was. That actually is something to remember, this whole thing about the princess, or Egyptian princess, so... Anyway, I don't... Is there anything else I'm supposed to do in here? I don't think there... Oh, yeah, there was. Okay, there's a key that I'll need for somewhere later, but... Anyway, I'll get back to you with the next relevant plot point, so... Alright, and after opening this case here and getting that piece of art out, Santa pulls us aside and says, Hey, I found this... Uh, bookmark with a four-leaf clover on it, and he hates it because he doesn't like hope, faith, love, and luck! So, yeah. That's, I guess it's technically important, but yeah, he hates these things, and last time you remember I said I didn't want it, and he tried to give it to Lotus, and she beat the crap out of him because he called her an old lady. So, yes, this time we must take it because it is important to the plot for some weird reason. That will become apparent later. After all, why shouldn't he? And because of this, we're going to get a slightly extended conversation with Santa here, too. Okay, it shouldn't be that relieving. Right. I can all betray you. Well, I suppose so. What was it? Hope, faith, love, and luck, or something? Well, whatever. Yeah, hope, faith, love, even your destiny, and luck. But, yeah. Hmm. Such a bitter personality. Okay. Weren't we already looking at each other? Oh. Why is that? Okay. Does that mean you hate Clover? <laughs> Four horsemen. <laughs> <laughs> nice one, Junpei. Nice preference there. Maybe back in the Dark Ages people cared about that, but... 
This is the 21st century. Oh yeah, and I remember it says somewhere that it's like 2012, <laughs> not 2015. <laughs> so it's a half-ass number. That's why. Yep, not the best or the worst. It's just you know somewhere sort of in the middle. Nine is a way better number, huh? Last place. Well, what about numbers higher than nine? At least it's not some middle number. You'd think you'd hate the number five then, too, but... Okay. Play. Play... Yeah, you mean like gambling or the stock market? If you say if you pick the stock market, he'll say that he actually does the stocks, which is kind of interesting information, but is actually somewhat relevant to something else, but we'll talk about that later. We'll give him what he wants. Gambling, yes! I'm not sure how old he's supposed to be, actually. Oh, Baccarat. Hey, that's what's going on on the other path, too. They call it Le Grand, or is it Le Grande? <laughs> anyway. These zeros, they call monkey. Monkeys are zeros, huh? Is there a zero in... Bakker? Like, what What cards represent zeros? Like, face cards? Zero's a monkey. <laughs> right, it's like, that's not what I meant. Oh. oh okay. <laughs> I guess he, uh... I guess you like that, okay. He's, uh, yeah, heck of a monkey, alright. Oh. Hey, Lotus, you're not beating up on Santa this time, I see. Doesn't use any of the digital root stuff, but, you know, you just drop the tens digit and that's it. Oh, yes, it does. Interesting. Whoever has nine wins. Person who makes nine wins, huh? Oh, yes, he talked about, well, we already know there's more than one door with a nine on it, but... At this point, we're not supposed to. Especially if it's the first time you're playing through, like me, somehow. <laughs> I can't believe I went to the way of the true ending the first time I played. Just by happenstance. So it was totally not difficult to do at all. It's just, basically, you just need to be nice to everybody. <laughs> going through these specific set of doors, and you'll be fine, but... That's why it's called the Nonary Game! Huh? What? Means something derived from nine or base nine. Ooh, that wasn't really that hard to figure out, honestly. I'm left with fix Nona, which means nine. One of your kids is named Nona, too. <laughs> well, one is Uni and you know unicorn, horse with one horn. Bi like binary and try like yeah try angle. <laughs> Trio, triple, triangle. Yeah, we don't need to go through the whole set of numbers there. Quart. Okay, I guess we do. Quart, quintisex, septum, and so on. Oct. Yeah. Yeah, we, we... This is, like, not terribly difficult to understand, Lotus. Yeah. Nana means nine. I guess it's sort of important to know. Not really, but... Well, one through nine, except num number nine is dead, but... We have nine hours. I think we basically established this. We have nine hours and nine doors and nine people. Come on, it's the name of the dang game. <laughs> Even though there's more than one number nine door. In fact, more than two, as we've already seen. It's got a real theme for the number nine. Yeah, no kidding. Anyway, that conversation... Oh, I guess it's not quite over. Is it? Oh, it's not. I think it's supposed to be over. Or the sad death scream of a big... Of a pig headed to the slaughterhouse. Thanks, Junpei! <laughs> okay, now it's over. So, I think I have... Yeah, I have all the pieces, so I'll just... You know, solve this real quick. And we get that whole conversation about... Uh, you know, about the... That's not the right one, is it? Oh, 
There we go. Isn't it? Oh. Well, okay, I'm totally not paying attention there, apparently. Oh, that's why it's wrong. <laughs> There we go. I was totally not even paying attention to what I was doing there. But yeah, we get this whole conversation again about the uh, morphogenic field, which, as you recall, I didn't even need to use the shower curtain. But yeah, as you recall, the morphogenic field is basically telekinesis. It's transfer transferring information from one person across a invisible field to someone else. And the correct answer is, of course, a dog. Yes, it's a dog. It's You can see it. And these are the front paws, and these are the back paws, and you'll never unsee it. But anyway, it doesn't matter what you say back there, but yeah, we got a point, and well, you got that whole story about that. You know, the if you want to get the whole big thing again, when can I fast forward? If you want to get the whole big story again, oh, I guess I'm gonna have to watch it now. Oh, well, anyway, yeah. If you want the whole big story again, I think I had that. Oh, there we go. Back in the fourth or fifth video, so yeah. She talks about this whole big old experiment. It's actually quite important to the plot there. So just to know about, <laughs> you'll find out why later. So anyway, let's get out of here. And, uh, into the next door. Well, I wasn't expecting this. Uh, this is actually the part where she says about... Where she, uh, June talks about the guy who wrote the book that, like, predicted the Titanic sinking and all that. And because I believe in curses the last time, she's suddenly saying something different. But it wasn't much different. <laughs> but yeah, he... And then it was a hoax, and... Yeah, Junpei's kind of weirding out on it, but anyway, we're just about to the other really important thing, because I just picked up the knife there. Not that it's actually necessary to get where I'm about to go, but... Alright, let's get actually to the point where I want to go. Hey, we just p picked up dry ice, because we're in the dang freezer again, or locked in the dang freezer again, and we get this whole conversation about carbon dioxide sublimation point, and, uh, you know, all that, and then she tells us about this thing... Where is it? Oh, well, she will tell us about this thing. It did strike... What stroke us as odd? Yeah, why doesn't it turn into a liquid first? Well, whatever it was we are talking about. Well, we it did strike Junpei as odd. So yeah, we're going to have a totally random conversation while dying in the freezer. But it can turn into liquid. What are we talking about? Carbon... Oh, carbon dioxide! Yes, why doesn't it turn into a liquid, uh, you know, before turning into a gas, when it's a solid first, or something like that. But when it's under high pressure, yet yeah, at, at uh, one atmosphere, normal air pressure, blah, 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 won't turn into liquid, right, whatever. Man, I totally was not paying attention to that whole thing. If you put it under high enough pressure... Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> I need to actually pay attention to what I'm reading. Sublimating. And change immediately. They kind of did go over this anyway, even when he said, I don't really want to know about it. But, uh... The conversation is going to keep on going. Yeah, what is the liquid between 32 degrees and 212 degrees? So, yeah, why not for carbon dioxide? Well, it's a different... Everything has a different freezing point. There's a kind of ice that doesn't turn into liquid when it goes above 32 degrees. A. I don't recall if we heard about this the last time or not. Yeah, its melting point is 96 degrees. Yeah, water that freezes at that at that temperature, which is crazy. They're talking 96 degrees Fahrenheit, by the way. I think. But this was too interesting, even though we're dying! <laughs> yeah. What is this ice with a melting point of 96 degrees called? It's called Ice 9. <laughs> right. If you're a fan of, uh... Oh, what was his name? 
uh, Kurt Vonnegut uh, was, it was, uh, invented this uh, idea of Ice Nine in one of his stories. Uh, if you've never heard of him, he's the guy who wrote Slaughterhouse Five. It's actually the only thing of his I've ever read before. But uh, anyway, it was a made-up. Oh, there it is by a science fiction author. That being Kurt Vonnegut. But then recently, scientists have discovered that such a substance actually exists, although in only in that their universe, not in real life, so far as I know. Yeah, this is the thing called Ice Nine, <laughs> or is it water? Yeah, it's a polymorph of H two O. Diamonds and graphite, huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. Normal water and this Ice Nine are like that. And she wasn't finished! Which legislation of glycerin. People cooled it, warmed it, and did all sorts of things to it. Okay. It never crystallized. And then one day in 1920, and I have no idea if this story is true, I'm kind of guessing it's not, some glycerin that was en route to England by ship was discovered to have crystallized during the trip. Ah, yes, totally crazy. Scientists are all over this stuff. Mm-hmm, fertile crystals in the question would be a simple matter. However, something very strange happened. You'll notice that there's a pattern between this story and certain other stories that we've actually already heard. I think actually the first time on the first time I went through this path, but uh, yeah, glycerin, yeah, samples it as well, and it didn't end there. After that day, all glycerin in the world began to crystallize naturally. And yeah, this is like similar to Santa's story with the rats and something that I don't think we've heard yet either. <laughs> But, uh, actually, there was some other story that they already told that we heard that was similar to this, but, well, anyway. Yeah, once the crystallization had begun, it was like, you know, everything could do it. Almost as if the information had transmitted over something like the morphogenetic field. Yeah, it's like all the glycerin in the world communicated or something crazy like that. was honestly impressed. Yeah, we didn't even get this question whenever I said I don't care last time. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting story. But, uh... Yeah, what does that have to do with Ice 9? Hey. It's a lot like Ice 9. Oh, I see. Yeah, if water everywhere started freezing at 96 degrees or below, that would be pretty bad. <laughs> Into the world, yeah. <laughs> Except in really hot locations. I guess people would have to all move to the equator, which, you know, wouldn't be possible, which would already, you know, would be bad for the overpopulation of the world anyway. Yeah, we're not going to have to worry about the end of the world if we die in the freezer! So, anyway... Yeah, that's enough of that. Yeah, no kidding. Seriously. Iceland? Santa doesn't live in Iceland. And Iceland isn't icy or cold anyway. <laughs> oh well. It's like, oh, I don't want to die in the freezer, so <laughs> he's selfish. God. Anyway. Continuing on to the next relevant plot point. Anyway, back to this decision again, and Ace the Bastard has put himself to sleep again. But anyway, we want to go through door seven this time. 
uh, again, I should say, and we'll get, uh, since we've been through Dwarf 4 first, we'll get some slightly different dialogue at, I think, two points here. So, anyway, getting to the relative point again. Well, you might remember this conversation where Seven suddenly remembers something because of the ethylendiamine tartrate there. Yeah, his memory suddenly comes back for some random reason. Yeah, something that happened 50 years ago. Yeah, this is that other story that I was thinking of, uh, where it talks about the industrial cleaner thing, the water crystals or something like that. Let's see. Yeah, water molecules start attaching themselves to the EDT crystals, and there's sort of mutation of the original crystals called hydrates. And this is a familiar-sounding story, isn't it? But since that day, no factory anywhere has been able to make a pure EDT crystal and all that. And you'll... I can't even remember exactly which video this was in, but all of a sudden, I can't fast forward anymore. Information in a way humans can't couldn't perceive. Yeah. Have a smirk, huh? That's it. That says exactly. Well, that's kind of what we talked about while we were in the freezer. <laughs> so, in the freezer. Yeah, well, you think of weird things when you're, you know, on the verge of dying. Yep, this room began to crystallize, and there's ice that would melt at room temperature. Hmm. You wouldn't think this would be at all important. Yep. Hold up, I feel like I can remember something. Oh. Last time, he couldn't remember anything. Yay. And randomly, we had to ask him, You don't know about Ice-9? Ice-9. Ice-9. Ice, ice, ice! And somehow, holy crap, this triggers some weird memory of his. That woman? Wait, what? Alice? We've been all through this shit. Who the heck is Alice? The woman who won't melt at room temperature. Say what now? She's an ice sculptor? Why did you suddenly remember this? Yeah, April 15th, 1912. Yeah. Yeah. Worst maritime... Oh. Accident in history. <laughs> he said it for me. Okay, never mind. Uh, the RMS Carpa uh, Carpathia? 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 Anyway. Cruise liner, just like the Titanic. <laughs> no. That was the ship that picked up the survivors. They collected the dead bodies was the McKay Bennett's. Ah, two days after the accident. Kind of morbid that they had to do that, but, you know. Set out from Halifax, Port in Canada. 306 bodies. Wow, out of 1,500. That's terrible. Yeah. The bodies he pulled out of the water were frozen solid. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Not a very nice story. Something more than just dead bodies. Things that drowned and carried with them, or stuff dislodged as the ship sank, and, you know, various little treasures, I guess you could say, but... And one of the things was a coffin. Dude, we've already found two coffins on this ship. A wooden one. And that coffin kind of looked like that. It was all wood. There were no nails or reinforcements, and there were no gaps in the wood anywhere, and it was air. That is a masterfully crafted coffin. Holy crap. <laughs> it's like, let's find out what's inside a coffin. Wow. And inside... Found the dead body of a woman. 
I know that this looks like Lotus, and it would be kind of weird if it turned out that Lotus was Alice and all that, but this is basically just what Junpei is imagining she looks like, or so the creator of the game says. So, it's not Lotus, even though that would have been kind of interesting. Ah. Oh, wow. But she didn't. And she, of course, was frozen solid, but she was already frozen, if you'll recall... Was it June's story? Yeah, it was June's story about the Egyptian princess. We had six spies were unloaded and taken ashore. However, it was warm enough that they began to melt. Oh, that must have been horrible. Stink was horrible. Oh, yep. But there was one body that didn't thaw. The girl in the coffin. Uh-huh. Yeah, you remember how she didn't uh, unfreeze when they were toting her through the desert and all that, too. Or didn't melt. But anyway, nothing happened. And it was summer, and she was still frozen solid. Apparently she permafrosted or something. Some sort of miracle. Ah. Uh. Call her All Ice, or <laughs> Alice. And they didn't last long. Why not? What? Next day, she wasn't. Someone snuck in, and they stole the bot. Wow. Well, it would be worth a fortune, considering that she was supposed to be, uh, well, technically a mummy. Well... You know, without the mummification part, and the wrappings, and, but, it's, you know, they found it in Egypt. <laughs> yeah, I see. She was on this boat. Yeah, what makes you say that? Why? Okay. You do? How do you know that? What happened? A black market in New York in 1912, huh? Or maybe 1913 by then. All millionaires from all over the world, yeah. And Alice went up for auction. And guess who won the auction? Lord Dashiell Gordain. <laughs> you remember the whole thing about Lord Gordain, how he bought the Gigantic, which we've theorized is the ship that we're on now. It was the sister ship, a, well, fictional sister ship, the Titanic. There was completely, there's two other ships that were, that were in real life. But anyway. Oh. Okay, so they brought that up. Yeah, he's the guy who brought the who bought the gigantic too. He's the guy who survived the Titanic, or well, one of the people who survived. But oh, I guess it was 1912 then. Okay, fine. It wasn't 1913 yet. And four years later, he bought the gigantic. Oh wow. And he had Alice somewhere on the gigantic. Why did he do that? And he died in 1931. This has been a mystery <laughs> for <laughs> almost a century now. Dang. Oh, wow. However... Where is Alice? And he said, In a small chamber past the forest of knowledge beneath the navel of the gigantic. Remember that for later. Yeah, sort of. Hey. I believe it. She's hidden somewhere in the gigantic, in the belly of the ship, apparently. Well, well. Oh, 
She did say that. Okay, basically. Yeah, yeah, we're we're coming, we're coming, Clover. So that's the story. It might be useful someday. <laughs> Why? Okay. I might remark on that like later why he says that it's kind of a strange thing to say don't you think <laughs> huh Alice huh and then there's a story about yeah the mum that's why it said it was a mummy but yeah the mummy that was that wasn't the mummy <laughs> cause it you know wasn't mummified for one thing all the way to when it got put on the Titanic for whatever reason, it was carried on the Titanic. And her body never melted. Whoa. Oh, priestess. I kept saying, I kept thinking princess, but oh well. Whoa. Weird connection. Huh. Yeah, this is nuts. What the heck does Alice and Ice Nine and... All that have to do with the plot at all. Well, we'll have to find out maybe next time on Let's Play Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors. Arrivederci.